So, Katrina, thank you so much. That was really nice. I'm deeply honored to be here with the other winners. I'm deeply honored to win this award. I was so pleased to learn about Ron Reidenauer. I mean, it's a great story, uh, what he did, particularly with My Lie, and then all his investigative journalism after that. I couldn't be here, of course, without having worked through the years with extremely talented people, starting in Nigeria, where I went to work for the Nigerian government before the Peace Corps, at Cravath in my three stints there at the church committee, in all my different jobs with New York City, and today at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU, where I've been privileged to be for 12 years now. Uh, and I've had the privilege of working with incredibly talented and dedicated people at nonprofits, particularly the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Vera Institute of Justice. I've been very, very lucky. I should also thank 1935. You say, when 1935? Well, 1935 was the year I was born. Now, what was special about it? <laughs> but it was special. It had the lowest birth rate in the history of America. <laughs> so if I've achieved anything in my life, it's because I've had no competition along the way. <laughs> Uh, loving friends have helped me, and loving family have helped me, too. I want to tell a little story about a piece of advice I got from Judge Learned Hand. For those of you who don't know who that was, despite that amazing name, Learned Hand, he was probably the most respected judge in the country in the 20th century who didn't get to the United States Supreme Court. Anyway, I was making up my mind between going to Nigeria to work for the Nigerian government, newly independent, and starting at Cravath, Swain, and Moore. And a number of establishment lawyers said to me, don't go to Nigeria. If you do that, you'll never become a real lawyer. It didn't seem to make much sense to me, but I went across the hall to the chambers of the 80-year-old Judge Leonard Hand, and I said, Judge Hand, I'm getting all this advice not to go to Nigeria because I'll never become a real lawyer. What do you think about that? He paused. He was about to die in a few months. He, he paused. That's irrelevant to the story. <laughs> he, he paused and he said, sounds like pure bullshit to me. <laughs> and. I've given that advice in similar form to a lot of young people. <laughs> go, go for it, go for it. The other thing I'd like to mention is the real debt that people of my era and ever since owe to the civil rights movement. It opened the doors, not just for blacks, but for everybody in the United States. And that was really important as a part of my life and many other people here in this room, it was important. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about the, some comparisons and some differences between the Cold War world that the Church Committee reviewed and the post-9-11 world that we face today. Now, they're both the same and very different. The basics are identical. Fear is the underlying motive for government going too far. And secrecy is the key implementing, implementing device for the government accomplishing what it does. But while the basics are the same, the circumstances are very, very different. Well, one enormous difference is the technology available to the government. Early in our investigation, Frank Church had a press conference to talk about the NSA, in which he warned that its capabilities were so great that if turned on the American people, there would be no place to hide. And then he said, we need oversight and we need, we need controls. But we now know today 
that the technological power that Church found so terrifying is a mere bagatelle compared to what we now, there now is. It was the stone age of technology compared to today. Now we know from Edward Snowden's revelations the nature and breadth and the amazing nature and the amazing breadth of NSA's power today. And those revelations by Edward Snowden helped mount and keep going a debate in this country that is vital to our future. <laughs> Paradoxically today, however, while the technology is much more powerful and much more scary, and the material collect collected is much more massive, actually, secrets today, because of technology, have a much shorter shelf life. It's harder to keep things secret today than it was during the era that we looked at at the Church Committee. The shelf life of secrets is shorter. I tried to develop this point in the book I'm writing called Democracy in the Dark, uh, which I hope is going to be, coming out in about 11 months, I hope is going to be the most detailed discussion of secrecy there's ever been uh, anywhere. Um, and it's being published by the wonderful Diane Wachtel at the New Press. And when the story went, was given about Sherry Fink continuing to write until the last minute, she gave me a big wink. <laughs> well, well, the last time I got a big wink like that was from Nino Scalia when I was arguing a case before the Supreme Court. And he then, he, I knew him at law school, and that's why he winked at me, but he then wrote the opinion that slammed us down in the, in the case. There are a couple of other reasons why the shelf life of secrets is shorter. One is there's much more oversight infrastructure today than there was before. Now, that oversight infrastructure is clearly imperfect. The committees that the church committee got created, the FISA court that the church committee got created, have since 9-11 become much less powerful and maybe much less motivated. But nonetheless, the infrastructure that has been established does um, help reduce the shelf life of secrets. Now, I've been talking about secrets a lot, probably because I'm preoccupied with the subject in that book I'm trying to finish. <laughs> uh, but secret government programs continue to challenge our values, American values and secrecy remains hard to tame. The Church Committee warned that the United States must not adopt the tactics of the enemy. Well, the most recent administration, right after 11, did explicitly adopt the tactics of the enemy. By deciding upon torture, and there's no way of escaping, that's what it was. It was not enhanced interrogation as they called in a euphemism, it was torture. <laughs> and we did adopt the tactics of the enemy. Waterboarding, which they employed viciously, the Bush administration did, waterboarding was used by the Japanese and we prosecute against American soldiers and we prosecuted the Japanese as war criminals. Did we forget that when we decided to use waterboarding? Uh, also, all of, the, all of the techniques that our government used to torture people came from a manual the military had called SEER. It's, I don't know what it stands for, S-E-R-E. -E. And it took techniques the Korean our Korean opponents in the Korean War had used to torture American soldiers and used the training based on what the Koreans had done to prepare our soldiers for possible um, torture when they were captured by some opponent. Now, again, amazingly, the most recent, the prior administration 
directly took their tactics that they used for torture out of the SEER manual, which came from what the North Koreans had done in order to elicit false confessions from American soldiers. Hardly something to be proud of. And you know, there's more there that we haven't yet discovered. So the Obama administration, in one of its first and admirable acts, abolished torture and released the opinions about torture, which had justified it and said it really wasn't torture. It was just like a doctor doing a bad job in a hospital or something like that. That was by John Yu, who was a little off in his legal analysis. Um, but the Obama administration, while abandoning torture and releasing the truth about what we were doing, has nonetheless applied the state secrets doctrine to prevent the courts from hearing cases by people who were tortured. And there's something wrong about a doctrine that says, and it, the, even the name, think of it, state secrets doctrine, it does not sound like a great piece of American jurisprudence. <laughs> so now, much more information is classified than was true, even under the Church Committee. It's much more of it's classified beyond top secret with a code word protection more stringent than top secret. And actually secrecy begets more secrecy and higher levels of secrecy because government, individual government people have to fight to have their document snowflake noticed and they figure a way to get it noticed is to increase the level of secrecy or else it'll be just cast aside. Now, for generations, bipartisan reports have found that there is too much secrecy. All those reports have met the same fate, wise words into the wind. It's far easier and less personally risky, as um, my colleague uh, Elizabeth Goitin reported recently, it's far easier and less personally risky to classify than declassify. Secrecy is seductive. It has many powerful psychological lures. Again, this has been seen by the difficulty President Obama's had in establishing his goal of more transparency. But a more fundamental flaw was the failure by Bush II and uh, when he established the NSA metadata program, and by Obama when he continued it, to have a open democratic dialogue about whether we should have those programs. That's what we should be fighting for, that before the government does something, which by the way, that, that wasn't kept secret in order to fool Al-Qaeda, that was kept secret in order to fool the American public. That happens much too much. So now to finish, what we need to do is go back to the basics of American democracy. In the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson said, a just government depends upon the consent of the governed. Well, the governed, the consent of the governed is not meaningful unless the governed are informed. And Abraham Lincoln, in the Declaration, called for the the keeping alive government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, you can't have government by the people unless the people are informed. So what is America going to do? Is it going to have the courage to face up to the facts, to find out and face up to the facts? Or is it going to continue to let things slide on without pushing for more disclosure and facing up to what we've been doing. I personally believe, maybe this is just naive, but I think all Americans have in their heart that we do believe in democracy. And I believe this country has the strength to hear the story and to learn from it that if we do so, we will remain a people who confront our mistakes and resolve not to repeat them, 
If we do not, we will decline. But if we do, our future will be worthy of the best of our past. Thank you.